if what keeps you going is recognition and acknowledgement, you'll stop pretty quickly. And if what keeps you going is a sense of happiness at what you're doing, you're going to stop. Because frankly, when you're giving, you don't stop when you become uncomfortable or angry or frustrated. The gratification, the joy, and the abundance come when you meet the need. Welcome to Redefiners, a podcast designed for daring leaders who are changing what it means to lead in today's increasingly complex world. I'm Nanas Motoshami, a leadership advisor at Russell Reynolds Associates. And I'm Clark Murphy, the former chief executive and also a leadership advisor. Nanas and I have spent our careers exploring what works and what's next in the realm of leadership. In each episode, we ask our guests deep and provocative questions about how they've challenged the norms and how they've redefined their organizations and ultimately themselves as leaders. Also, you can answer this one question. How are you redefining your leadership? Perhaps the boldest question yet. Conversations that matter. Inspiration for us all, whether you're kicking off your career or crafting your legacy. Thanks for joining us. Let's dive in. Hi, everyone, and welcome to Redefiners. So in today's episode, we get to talk with an innovative leader who's brought about change, not only in business, but also in life. Our guest today is a leader who successfully bridged the U.S. and Chinese cultures to help build and establish truly global brands in the world's two biggest markets. Now, this is not easy, Clark. I've certainly worked with an awful lot of people who have tried and unfortunately failed. So I'm curious to hear her tips on how you bridge these cultures. But actually, on a personal level, I'm also really interested to hear her perspective on how you live a more purposeful life by defining your social legacy. And as I creep towards 45 and middle age, it's something that I'm actually spending an awful lot of time discussing with my coach is, you know, what is my real purpose? What am I actually here to do beyond just working hard, being a good colleague, being a good advisor to my clients, being a mom, being a good wife? So very interested to hear her perspective on that as well. And how to balance all of that. I'm fascinated, too, because she's in the nexus of the changing consumer world in China, which happens so quickly, and I'm not sure most people actually understand that. I think they underestimate who the Chinese consumer is, how quickly things happen, they change, and they respond. So can I learn from her? No question. Am I slightly intimidated? Yep, Um, but pretty excited to have this conversation. And our guest today is Emily Chang, CEO of McCann World Group China, Prior to McCann, she held executive roles with Starbucks and Intercontinental Hotels China, P&G, and Apple. Emily sits on the board of SOS Children's Villages and has a best-selling book titled The Spare Room. Emily, welcome to Redefiners. Thank you for joining us. Thank you both so much for having me. So Emily, we'd love to start, that there is a lot to talk about, but we'd love to start the conversation uh, to talk a little bit about you and your journey as to how you got to where you are today. Um, you went to University of Rochester School of Medicine. You also did your MBA there. Subsequent to that, you did some executive and leadership programs at both Harvard as well as INSEAD. Can you tell us a little bit about that journey from what you originally went to university for and what has actually brought you to live in China today? Of course. My daughter was just asking me this. She said, mom, how many people actually end up in careers for which they studied? And we looked up the statistic. I can't remember off the top of my head now, but it's not that much. (laughs) When I was, in fact, just about her age, she's 13 now, I wanted to be a pediatric oncologist. So it was a subspecialty. I was very focused on getting into medical school. So I studied biology, I minored in chemical engineering. I was really looking forward to going into a med school and I got in and then I suddenly realized, in fact, I don't have the emotional distance to be good at what really calls to my heart. And I think that's really been a life lesson she and I were just talking about, which is you can have a life passion. It doesn't have to be your career. You can love what you do. And like my calling to take care of vulnerable children has become the spare room. And it's become something that our entire family partakes in now. So I ended up pivoting to MBA. So I ended up studying corporate finance and strategy because they seemed like close cousins to science. I was recruited by Procter & Gamble 
in corporate finance and immediately transitioned to brand management. And then I added some executive programs later. So I guess what you can see is it was a little bit meandering, Mm -hmm. but maybe a secret to success in my education and my professional life is being open to something that's not on the plan and saying, that sounds like it could be pretty interesting. Let's see where it goes. And do you think you've kind of reached the end of that plan or you think there's more to come and more meandering to come in the future? I think when we stop um, thirsting for new experiences, when we no longer have that curiosity that drives us, I think life is has got to be just become much more dull. In fact, I just accepted an adjunct professorship at NYU because I not only like learning, I like teaching. So I can't imagine wow. that this will ever stop. <laughs> Good. Okay, Emily, the Chinese consumer kind of scares everybody. And what's happening and how fast and, and what's the scale? I mean, you've had operating roles in China and the U.S. with multinationals. You're known for bridging the Chinese and U.S. cultures to build brands. So many people have tried and failed to conquer the Chinese consumer market. What are the lessons you've learned how to be successful in China and really understanding or leveraging the Chinese consumer? I love that question, Clark. Two things come to mind, so maybe I'll touch on them both. The first is, I think fundamentally, there's an opportunity to redefine failure. And in fact, I think there's a very, very thin line between failure and learning. In Mm. the Western world where I grew up, we, especially, you know, 11 years at Procter & Gamble, we set clear milestones. If we don't prove success at milestone A, we do not proceed to milestone B. So by the time we put something in market, we have a very high likelihood of success. Whereas I think the Chinese mindset is flipped. It is, let's get something in market as soon as possible. It's not going to be great. We're going to fall on our faces. We'll find things that are completely broken that don't work, but that is the best way to iterate and learn as fast as possible. So I think where the Western culture might deem something a failure, the Chinese will say, well, that was a very good way to learn quickly. As you know, Emily, I've been to China many, many, many times. Uh, and we have this concept of the big product launch in America, and we see how it goes. Versus China, you put it in the market, 500,000 consumers are going to give you feedback in a month, and then you can iterate in 90 days and keep going. Right. That scale and speed of iteration I find fascinating about China. Has there been any time that you said either it's too fast for us to react, or how do you find the right pace of iteration to know that you're actually not moving too quickly to get all this feedback? What's your take on this? I don't think there's anything that's too fast. I think this this is a little bit actually the second point that came to mind when you asked the question, which is embracing the and. I think a lot of times we talk either or um, in the Western Mm -hmm. culture. I grew up thinking, well, what's better, A or B? You know, even by definition, we talk about A, B testing. What if we unpack that paradigm and went and? So, So to your question, here's an example. What's too fast? There's a really interesting company that is creating fake products. What I mean by that is they're creating an advertisement, a simple video, and they're posting it. And they're seeing how many people want to buy it. Everybody who wants to buy it is disappointed because it's, quote, sold out. The reality is the product doesn't even exist. But this advertisement shows you actual purchase intent, people who are trying to buy. Now you flip the paradigm on its head, you turn around and you say, okay, 65,000 people want to buy the Hello Kitty bubblegum flavored mouthwash. Let's go make it. And then we'll go let those people know we're quote back in stock. What a different Mm. paradigm shift where we're so fast, we're actually collecting the information before the product's even designed. And in today's world of supply chains and the complications of the world we're living in, assembly and manufacturer, can you actually get that product out? Can you get it out in a reasonable enough time to satisfy this consumer? Absolutely. I think that goes to the power of and. And I think that's where China has developed so quickly. I think Chinese brands are now able to achieve scale and agility. And I think that is something that we're often speaking to international brands about because we have scale do we have that agility? In the past, we haven't. The Chinese have had the agility, but not the scale. Now, when they have both, it forces multinational companies to really interrogate, what is my value proposition? What do I bring uniquely to enter and win in the China market? So fascinating. I mean, you've got to stay agile. Agility again, how quickly China's market has changed. Even the last 10 years to this consumer agility that, that you're describing. That's why I think so many non-Chinese companies have this older version of 
of China and the, and the manufacturer, and they're missing the consumer market. They're not seeing you've got to be iterating so quickly. Yeah. So Emily, you are currently the CEO of McCann World Group China. And for our listeners who may not know, this is a, a global marketing agency. Before joining McCann, you were always on the client side. What made you switch to the service side? And I ask as someone who's only ever been in professional services, and, and to your point, I love it because of the variety, because you're doing something different all the time and you're learning. But as much as I love my clients and I love my job, there are days where I think, why do I do this? Why am I on the service side? So tell us a little bit about your journey. How have you found it? What have been some of the challenges? Well, if I take a step back, Nanaz, I had four jobs prior to this one. In fact, I hadn't even worked. I, I know folks at Russell Reynolds, but I hadn't worked with a headhunter for any role because, you know, when I was at p and I received an email from Apple recruiting. When I was at Apple, I received an email from IHG's leadership, et cetera. So when I took one year off to write this book, which is a side project, I wanted to pursue a passion before I retired because I kept thinking in the back of my mind, I really want to do this. When I retire, I will dot, dot, dot. And I think we all yeah. have those. But I suddenly realized I worked for 22 years and some of these stories in my passion project example, they might start to fade. So let me take one year, give myself that time and explore it. And then I can figure out what I want to do next. And so to answer your question, I had the rare opportunity of really having a blank sheet of paper and saying, okay, as I go back to work, where do I want to go? What's my paradigm? And what I ended up at got me to an agency, although that was never even in my consideration set. So what works for me, you know, in my mid forties, I've worked a while. I have a while left. Head is the first piece. I love being intellectually challenged and the digital world is really, really intriguing to me. And it's, you know, growing exponentially. So I want to be a part of that. It's not particularly filtering because who's not digital. (laughs) Then there's heart, which is, I love taking care of people. And now that I'm a little older, I really love watching some of the younger people flourish and find their Mm -hmm. feet. And then soul, I just wrote this book about authentic leadership. And it was really important to me more than ever to find a company that shared my ethos. So when I came up with this paradigm of head, heart, and soul, I had three offers. Um, Mm -hmm. One was great with the head, perhaps not so good with the soul. One was really good with the soul and the heart, but maybe not so much the head. And then it turns out McCann is certainly a company I knew uh, very well by reputation, McCann Head is fantastic because we're driving change at what is a traditional forays agency to become the partner that I always wanted being a CMO. From a heart standpoint, I'm running a couple of agencies, taking care of hundreds of young people. So that's delightfully fun. And then Seoul, McCann really stands for something that I love. I feel like I've met my tribe because Mm -hmm. we talk about helping brands earn a meaningful role in consumers' lives. So as I became more Uh, familiar with McCann, I thought it really fits my model. And I think it's the perfect place to go next. I love your model. I am definitely going to steal that head, heart and soul and apply it to to myself and my candidates, in fact. Now, Emily, when you took over the agency, it wasn't in the best of shapes, right? It it required quite a lot of change and turnaround. Take us through that. So McCann's a great brand. We have amazing client partners. We have some very good work. In China, it had been a while since we'd really done outrageously cool stuff. It had been um, a little slower on the uptake when it comes to digital engagement. And, you know, my last couple of roles at Starbucks and at Intercontinental Hotels was all about creating online and offline integrated branded experiences. I'm hugely passionate about this. And, you know, a lot of, it's not just McCann, a lot of these traditional agencies were still saying things like, are you working above the line or below the line? And I was like, guys, there's been no line for like a decade. I don't know where you're drawing the line. So the chance to really revolutionize how we think about ourselves was really important. So is it easier to do that in China than it is in the U.S. to recognize there's no more line? Do people get it? I think it's much easier in China. I don't think the line is here. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And Clark, to your previous comment, um, agility is definitely a strength of the Chinese culture. And therefore, you know, even if there were a line, we'd find our way to wiggle around it and over it and under it. (laughs) But the line isn't here. And when we have a situation like BAT by Dua Alibaba and Tencent, we can accelerate 
what we call a digital ecosystem so much quicker because the giants are sort of integrated and there are ways that we can um, take an idea or a desired end experience and get to that end state so much faster in partnership. I'd love to ask about differences and challenges, but can we just go back for a sec to head, heart, and soul? So let's, let's be realistic here. In the last couple of years, we've all been through a lot of stress, frustration, reflection, uncertainty, and now am I in the right place for my head, heart, and soul? Isn't that kind of easier for you to say than it is someone 10 to 15 years your junior? You're in charge of your career. You've got a TED Talk, you published a book, you're doing well, you're well known, but somebody 15 years more junior, they're not there yet. Is it realistic you can be right in your head, heart, and soul that much earlier in your career? I think it's not only realistic, I think it's something people know they can and should be pursuing. And I'm so impressed with the generations that are coming behind me. They're coming in earlier and saying, I would love to not work two decades before I realize I'm not at the heart of what I want to be. Or I would love to learn earlier on, you know, what is my purpose? How do I articulate it in a meaningful way and let that serve as my North Star as I embark on my career? They are looking inward and saying, who do I want to be? What is my raw material and how do I maximize that? And that's why I think this book has been so well received by younger people because it's not a sexy subtitle, (laughs) but it literally is what I think people are looking for, which is live a more intentional life. It's better to do that earlier than later (laughs) and lead with authentic purpose. We'll be right back with Emily, but first we're going to hear from Karis Wong, an executive director in our Hong Kong office, about some of the challenges C-suite leaders may face in China. Despite COVID and geopolitical challenges, global companies still have their eyes set on China. To win in China, companies must first win in the highly competitive talent market. We recently conducted research of Western and Chinese leaders in the financial services sector and found that the two groups foster distinctive leadership styles and have vastly different expectations on how to lead and operate. Chinese leaders favor a more pragmatic and less disruptive approach to setting strategy. Both groups are equally ambitious and heroic in leading their teams towards success. However, Chinese leaders prefer to set a firm direction from the top and tend to be more focused on the task at hand, while Western leaders are more likely to prioritize rallying teams and fostering emotional commitment. Chinese leaders seek to create a value-driven workplace and value security, stability, recognition, and work-life balance much more. To bridge these differences, balance your China leadership team to ensure a diversity of styles and capabilities, and develop a robust communication strategy and review risk and compliance expectations. To learn more about our capabilities in cross-cultural leadership assessments, go to russellreynolds.com slash insights. And now back to our conversation with Emily. Emily, let's switch gears and talk about your book, The Spare Room, um, where you, as I mentioned earlier, talk about living a purposeful life by defining your social legacy. Before you tell us what that means, um, I wanted to first ask you about the name of the book, because it's a rather bizarre name. Where did that come about? (laughs) We've had 17 kids now over the last 23 years staying in our spare room. And some of these kids just come with extraordinary stories. I wanted to share those stories because they've changed our lives and the way we look at the world around us. I also wanted to use the opportunity to share some of maybe like the larger cracks in the social justice system that people don't know about, like child marriage in America, or like, uh, there's just so many different stories that you could read about. But eventually my model of sort of chicken soup or maybe the moth Mm -hmm. started to evolve because I started realizing as I stopped to do a TEDx talk during the writing of the book, there is something more meaningful here. And there is, what, what is it that I really want to share? What's my idea worth sharing? And it really became the idea that the spare room is just mm-hmm. a euphemism. I think it's much deeper than that. And this is the thing about when you really interrogate, what do I want people to take away? It, I started to realize people fall in one of two camps. You either know your offer, generally, what are my resources, my skills, my experience that I can bring to the table, but you may mm-hmm. not know where you want to direct them. Or you generally know your offense, which is the thing that's really calling to you, but you don't know what you want to do about it. So let me just clarify. The, uh, the offense is the issue that you or we face, and the offer is how we as individuals can help. Yeah. 
So the model is really simple. If you can define your offer, and I believe there's power to words, whether it is defining what you want in your career, whether it is defining what you want to do in this job that you have right now, or whether it is in defining your social legacy, you define your offer and your fence and that intersection, the social legacy is what you want to leave behind. Now, I do want to go back to an incident that first sparked it because I've, I've, heard you describe it. It is incredibly moving. I'd I'd love for our listeners to hear about it as well. So can you sort of tell us about the first incident that sparked this whole idea? I had just turned 20. I was still an undergrad. So there's by no means was I trying to be a good person or or was I intelligently defining my social legacy? You know, things look good in in hindsight, but sometimes people like me, we're slow learners. It takes us a while before we're like, gosh, there seems to be a trend here. But back then I was driving late at night in upstate New York and a little uh, shadow caught my attention to the left of the driver's seat. And when I was at a red light, I kind of took a double glance and realized that it was a girl who was sitting on the curb in the sleeting rain of upstate New York. And so I unrolled my window and I asked if she needed anything. And as she lifted her head, you could see in the glow of the traffic light, her eye was swelling. She had a swollen lip that was bleeding in the rain. And I realized she, she was so young looking. I couldn't tell how mm. old she was, but, but certainly you know, not, not having graduated high school. So I just asked her if I could buy her dinner. So we went to a diner just down the street. I bought her dinner and then she started to walk away. I mean, she was just dripping. She was beaten up. She had nothing on her. She was this skinny, frail little thing. And I just, I couldn't let her go back out there. So there wasn't a lot of intention at that point. It was just visceral. I just Mm. said, where are you going to stay tonight? And she didn't respond, but she stopped. And I remember thinking she has nowhere to go. And I just said, you can stay with me. So she came to my apartment and stayed for one night. She was hostile. Like the, a lot of times when you give, it's not a Hallmark movie. <laughs> yeah. It's not something beautiful and warm and fuzzy. It was awkward. She asked me if I was a pedophile. She straight up asked me that. She stayed as far away from me as she could in my apartment. I mean, who was she to trust me? And I, you know, in the first day, I didn't even know her name, but eventually we got to know each other. And, you know, this is something that I think is, really important for us to think about. A lot of times we don't think we have capacity to do things like this, but you have capacity to invite somebody to dinner and you have capacity to let them crash on your couch. And then you realize you're not going to kick them out the next day. And then you have capacity to have them for a week. And suddenly you realize you have a roommate and she's actually adorable. And you're really enjoying watching her sort of recover from whatever she's been through. She stayed with me for about four months. And I think I, in some ways, really lucked into that experience because it opened my heart. It Mm. opened my heart in a way to say, if you see somebody who needs something, it's not that hard to say yes. And you'll be shocked to see how much capacity you actually have to help somebody else. And in the meantime, by the way, you help yourself much more than you ever help anybody else. Absolutely. Um, Would you say that that is your redefining moment? I mean, the show is called Redefiners. We always ask our guests, you know, what was the one or two moments in life that helped redefine their career? Would you say that was it for you? Or do you think you were sort of too young and it's only with hindsight that you realize that changed your outlook? we're given just hundreds and hundreds of these amazing opportunities and some we miss and it's okay. And some we pick up and they start shaping, they start shaping where we're going. But if I thought about redefining moments, there are a couple, like I said, I'm a slow learner. There was this young man named Jashin. He's a, he's from South Korea. He was staying with us one night. He sat back after dinner and he said, this house, he had very broken English, this house, good kibun. And my husband is Korean. So he kind of nodded. And I kind of looked at the two of them and I said, what's kibun? (laughs) And he said, there's no English word for it. Kibun is, and he went, he burped. And they went, "Ah, it is a comfort for the spirit. And I thought, oh, that was my defining moment. Because I feel I had the spare room sort of as my sort of purpose or my, my, the center of that intersection, the social legacy. But it's not the room. The room is only a space. What I want to do is I want to create comfort for the spirit. And that's something that so beautifully transcends from home to work. So Mm -hmm. comfort for the spirit means you come in my house and you just open the fridge and grab a beer. You don't have to ask, kick off your shoes. Comfort for the spirit at work means you walk in and you don't feel anxiety. You don't worry about your schedule. In fact, you go, ah, 
I'm so glad to be here. I get to be myself and I know that I am loved and valued for exactly who I am. That was, that was a redefining moment for me. But to get to the kibun, I'm sure there were tough times, right? Because you are, as you say, when you show love, um, when you show kindness, people don't automatically trust you, right? Um, and again, I've, I've sort of heard you talk about one of the children that you took in didn't know how to wash herself, for example, right? Didn't use sanitary towels. What, in those difficult moments, what keeps you going? I think what keeps you going is the most important question because if what keeps you going is somebody else's gratitude, you may never get started. (laughs) If what keeps you going is recognition and acknowledgement, you'll stop pretty quickly. And if, if what keeps you going is a sense of happiness at what you're doing, you're going to stop very short of your goal. Because frankly, when you're giving, you don't stop when you become uncomfortable or angry or frustrated. You stop when that need is met. But when you realize that your end goal is different, when you redefine it or reframe it as, I want to meet this need, the gratification, the joy and the abundance come when you meet the need, when you deliver against that goal you set for yourself. And then, you know, later, maybe in a year or maybe much, much later, she'll look back and she will appreciate it. Or maybe she never will. Emily, capacity is a great word. Uh, And a number of people, managers and people earlier in their careers, feel like they're at their capacity because of the pandemic or whatever challenge they might be facing right now. How do you help someone envision slightly greater capacity? How do you think about building capacity? It's all about operational discipline. It's a super unsexy answer, but to me, that's what works. Uh, Two thoughts come to mind. Think about yourself in terms of flex capacity. So if you have 100% to give, if you're working at 100% and then suddenly something requires 110, you're tapped out. You'll burn yourself out like that. That's the first thought. But then the second one goes into operationally, how do you build that space? How do you create, craft, force that buffer into your schedule? And it comes from, in my view, the micro moments and then build out from there. So the very small micro moment is how do you build capacity between meetings? So instead of 60 minute meetings, book 55, right? So if you build that in and that's all you get, you now give yourself five minutes for biology (laughs) or to finish that meeting, push it aside and start fresh in the next meeting, which also makes each of the following meetings more effective. I think at the weekly level, then, how do you build in the time to get work done? I think it requires an understanding of what gives you energy and what takes energy away. So this requires a little bit of ruthlessness, and I think it requires um, a lot of brutal honesty when it comes to who do you like to meet with? Let's be honest. Mm -hmm. Who sucks your energy dry? Well, I acknowledge it. It's okay. Cause that's what it is. If these people suck you dry, don't put their meetings in the beginning of the day, put it at the end. If there's something that gives you energy, don't wait till the end of the day, start your day off with it. What you're doing is scheduling. You're intentionally managing your calendar to manage your energy. So at all of those micro moments, I think enable capacity and all those little things open up and they amplify and suddenly you realize You know, you can have a big job and you can have a full family. You can pursue your passions and you can still have, like right now it's 8.45 at night. You can still have a ton of energy at the end of the night because you've managed it. And and that's something that only you can do. Mm -hmm. Take control, take control, take control. You create your micro moments daily and weekly. I love that. Emily, I want to go back to to the spare room. Um, And as I hear you talk... um, I sort of think about about myself and and, um, one of the things that I have taken offense to recently is what's happening in in the Ukraine. Um, And I've been trying to convince my son, he's an only child, I've been trying to convince him that we should offer up our house. Um, There's a scheme in the UK where you can offer your home to refugees. And I can see that he really struggles because there's a part of him that really wants to do it. Mm-hmm. especially when he sees the scenes uh, on TV. But then there's a part that, I mean, he's scared. He's basically scared of the unknown. How did you, I'd love to learn from your daughter's experience. What what did she take away from the spare room, having sort of your, the guests come and go? Do you, how, how did it enrich her, do you think? 
I think it has shaped a really unique human that I almost took for granted until I started writing the book because she's grown up always with someone in the spare room, a younger, older, male, female sibling. And so for her, I remember when I started writing the book, she's like, mom, who wants to read this? Like, wh- what's different okay. about it? Okay. And I said, oh, you know, I never stopped to tell you, like a lot of people don't just open their spare room <laughs> and have people live with them. But a lot of people do really extraordinary things. The second thing that strikes me is as a parent, I think sometimes if we think our kids have some tension and they're interested, but they're afraid, we make the call. Sometimes we just say, let's do it. And in fact, our 17th kid who just moved out of our place two months ago, Lainey was on the fence about, because she's now 13 and she likes Mm. her privacy and she doesn't like a lot of loud noises when she's studying or playing cello. And she was on the fence. And I said, Lainey, we have said before, we're always going to say yes when someone needs a spare room. So we're going to do it. And my job was then to make sure we minimized the negative impact on our family and reminded her of the bigger good. I like that. So um, Emily, we like to end each podcast with some rapid fire questions. So this is where we are going to ask you a series of five questions and we ask you to respond as quickly as possible. Are you ready? I'm ready. (laughs) So question number one, what's the best book that you've read in the last six months? In the last six months, I started reading, rereading Isabella Lende, and now I'm reading with my daughter and she is just a beautiful writer. Yeah, she is. And speaking of social justice, she has a lot to say. So reading what she says, how she says it, the emotion behind it and the intent is something that's wonderful to sort of re-experience this time with my teenager. Who was the mentor that had the biggest impact on you? I would say my current mentor is incredible, Cheryl Backhelder. She is a female CEO who is so well-established, who has so much wisdom to share and who is so exceedingly patient in listening to my questions and answering them thoughtfully and helpfully. And who is your idol or hero? Malala is the first one that just popped into my head. That came out of nowhere. I think she was so young and she was so driven and so clear in who she was and now who she is. Hmm. She's such an inspiration. You know, we were just talking earlier. Clark was asking, can people 10 years younger than us really appreciate the spare room and living with more intentionality? Well, she was about 35 years younger than me (laughs) when she chose to make some very serious moves and, and declare, you know, what she wanted to stand for and was willing to live and die for. And what's the most significant leadership lesson you've learned, particularly given the last few years? It's okay. And you you should expect to be wrong. I think we're so keen on creating a veneer of looking like we're right or we know better or or people can trust us. But actually, (laughs) who's always right? And actually, when you're wrong sometimes and you acknowledge and you learn from it, you earn deeper trust because people then understand you're real and they're coming along with you for the journey. But I think growing up, maybe in part as well, being an Asian woman raised by immigrant parents, Nobody ever told me it was okay to be wrong. (laughs) Right. You should be wrong sometimes. And if you're not, maybe you're not stretching yourself enough, or maybe you're not acknowledging that you are. Yeah. And it's okay to admit that you're wrong and you made a mistake, right? And the last question, which I have to say is my favorite question. If you could spend an evening in someone else's spare room, whose would it be? Christopher Nolan. (laughs) (laughs) This person's mind is fascinating to me. We've been on a Christopher Nolan kick and I would just like to spend a night in his spare room and talk to him and hear how he thinks. (laughs) Thank you. Wow. Emily, we cannot, cannot, cannot thank you enough. This is a high octane discussion. I think it's inspirational and I'd say it's challenging. I sit here as the father of four children, grown children, to think about my capacity and then your definition. And I'm probably not maximizing capacity of my own capacity, but yet I'm daunted by thinking about more capacity. So you've challenged me, you've challenged our listeners, and we got to think about what we do, how we do it, and the kind of energy to go do it. So thank you very much. Just to recap a couple of things, maybe focus first on China and the Chinese consumer. The two things you've talked about are redefining failure, embracing the and, and redefining failure again. There's such a thin line, or there can be a thin line, between failure and learning, and how well we pivot on failure is actually how well we learn and move forward. And it's not A or B, it's fast iteration and understanding that. 
But more importantly is your journey and your concept to say, be willing to meander. So many people think they have to know where they're going, but we cannot let the world just take us along. And you've chosen in this recent chapter to be more intentional about a role with head, heart, and soul. Head, heart, and soul. We need to pursue that and being the authentic person to find our head, heart, and soul. And you think that exists. The younger people are more intentional now than perhaps I was or Nanaz was. But this intentionality is the powerful part. Hugely inspiring. And uh, off we go. Thanks, Emily. Thank you so much, Emily. Thank you, guys. It was so nice to meet you. Thanks for the fun chat. Thanks for joining us on this episode of Redefiners. For more dynamic insights from leaders from across industries and around the world, listen to Redefiners wherever you get your podcasts. And to learn more or get in contact with us, visit our website at russellreynolds.com, find us on LinkedIn, and follow us on Twitter at RA on Leadership. See you next time. Do you have a question on leadership, career development, joining a board, or other topics you'd like to ask one of our consultants? Well, now's your chance. Send us your question. Email us at redefiners at russellreynolds.com for an opportunity to have your question answered on the podcast by one of our experts. See you next time on Redefiners.